Good evening, everybody. It is wonderful to finally get the opportunity to visit with you all here at Cold Harbor. I have only heard good reports from you from multiple different places, uh, not the least being my uh, congregate, my home congregation over in Purcellville. Uh, and we have many members who have visited with you or have been here for a while and they only speak highly of you. And it's not just the ones that are related to your preacher. And uh, <clears throat> this work here, this lectureship, uh, 26 years of having something like this, this is, that is a great accomplishment. And it's wonderful that the congregation here is so dedicated to the um, idea that we're going to spend a little time digging into the meat of God's word and preparing ourselves to make better Christians and evangelists of us all. That's a wonderful thing. And there's a couple of great things about having a lectureship. One of them is um, getting a few uh, new people around to be able to uh, teach from the scriptures. It doesn't matter how good a preacher is. And by the way, you got a good preacher over here, but it doesn't matter how good a preacher is. There's a little bit of artistry to preaching. And just like any every art, uh, there's not going to be an artist that absolutely works with everybody. There are ones who are more popular, but they're never, uh, they no, don't work for everybody necessarily. And so getting uh, maybe somebody with a little bit of a different style can be very helpful to individual members on occasion. The other thing is perspective. And different people have different perspective. For example, if somebody says, I want to know the perspective on the book of John from somebody who has dedicated a lot of time specifically to studying the ancient languages uh, from which we translate the Bible, then you might say, I want to listen to what Cameron Miller has to say. If I want to go to somebody who has uh, decades of preaching experience, somebody who uh, has also put, in, uh, put much time into the field of psychology and understanding that, well, you might want to listen to someone like Archie Green. And if you want to listen to some hillbilly and what he's got to say, well, then you came to the right spot. That's what I'm here for. And one more other thing I want to say real quick is that I'm just tickled to death. I didn't know he was going to be here with uh, Dave Deagle. Um, if you are considering the work of preaching, or if you know somebody who's considering the work of preaching, make sure you stop in and see him. The uh, West Virginia School of Preaching, where I graduated from, they're doing fantastic work over there. And uh, I'll tell you what, they're great about uh, setting up some well-learned and sound preachers. All right, now if you turn in your Korans to Surah 9. <laughs> All right, John chapter 1 is where we're coming from. John's gospel is unique among the four gospels. And this is not something I came up with on my own. Oh boy, it came off the clip entirely. That's all right. There we go. John's gospel is unique among the gospels, and that's not something I came up with. A lot of people have noticed that before, which is partially why we have a separation in the titles of these gospels. You're not going to see them in your Bibles, but often they are referred to Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic gospels, John as the autoptic gospel. You can almost figure out what they mean if you just break apart the words on that. You take the word optic, it means to see, right? If you go to an optometrist, you're working on your vision. And then you have sin, in the case of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's not sin, S-I-N, that's sin, S-Y-N, like uh, synchronize, together is the idea. And so synoptic means to see together, and autoptic, that's auto myself, right? If something's automatic, it does it on its own. So the autoptic gospel is John. Now, they're typically uh, categorized this way because of the difference of content. When you look in Matthew, Mark, and I did it again. I might, if this happens a third time, you're going to have to hold me to it, but I might just have to stay close to the podium, Mike. But I think I... That one doesn't count. I know I said a third time. That one doesn't count. But I think I just figured out what I'm doing to make that happen. 
it says, as long as I remember to not put my hand in my left pocket, we should be okay. And scream at me if you see me about to do it. <laughs> uh, besides the difference of content, and you do see a difference of content in the synoptic gospels versus the autopic gospel, a lot of things uh, can be found in these three, and they're not exactly the same, otherwise there wouldn't be a point in having different gospels. But they cover a lot of the same events in Jesus' life. Whereas John, he is very unique in a lot of things that he's covering. This is not a contradiction. This is just that these writers over here felt the need to include these particular events in Jesus' life. And then John, he felt to, the need to include other events. In fact, at the end of the book of John, John will just outright mention he has absolutely not written down everything that needs to be written about Christ, or could be written about Christ, I ought to say. And he very poetically says that if someone were tried to do that, they uh, all the books in the world would not be able to contain. But beyond the difference in content between the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel, there is a bit of a difference in mood and goal of the book that is you can really feel it as you're going through it. Although the chapter and the section of the chapter we're going to be studying is very high and theological in its nature, that's actually the exception to the book of John. For most of John, he keeps it very close and personal. And you'll notice that when you're looking through John, he is often mentioning this nature of Christ. And if you were to look in, say, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3, you might understand why he's so obsessed with the nature of Christ. And in 1 John 4 and verse 3, he talks about the usage or, or, or the confession of Jesus coming in the flesh and how anybody does not confess Jesus in the flesh does not have God. Well, why is he doing that? There was a beginnings of a false doctrine that was starting to spread through the church. Even in John's time, we call that Gnosticism. And uh, Gnosticism was this belief that those who practice it had a special knowledge, and that is a complete separation of the flesh and of the spirit. According to the Gnostics, the flesh was evil and sinful by nature, and the spirit was good and pure by nature. Therefore, Jesus could not have possibly come in the flesh because the flesh is by nature sinful. And so they believed that Jesus only appeared to have come in the flesh. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. For one, if Jesus never came in the flesh and there was no real resurrection, you cannot kill a spirit by crucifying uh, the spirit. And if there's no resurrection, well, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul goes into a lot of detail about why that can't be. John is very clearly concerned with this idea that Jesus did not truly come in the flesh. Now today, you don't run into a whole lot of people who do not confess that Jesus came in the flesh if they confess that Jesus came at all. Now there are plenty of people who will say that Jesus was just not even a historical figure, but a myth. But I don't typically run into people who will make the claim that when Jesus came, he wasn't a real human being. But you will run into a lot of people who believe that when Jesus came, he was not God. And interestingly, although John's focus appears to be on dealing with that Gnostic heresy, the idea that Jesus didn't really come in flesh, he also at the same time makes it extremely clear that Jesus, while fully human, just like you or I, was fully God. Nothing like you or I, except that we are made in his image. We aren't going to get into all the difficulties that go along with trying to understand the triune nature of God and how one can be 100% man and 100% God at the same time. I don't think there's a lot that can be uh, profited, really, by just dealing with that sort of thing. So let's go ahead and look into the scripture right now. And uh, one more thing I want to mention before we start in John chapter 1 and verse 1 um, is that John 
when he speaks to his audience, you can already see this, I, I like to call it the personality change that we see within John. And what I mean by that is this, when we read about John in the gospels, we don't see a ton about him and at least what kind of person he was, not compared to someone like Peter, right? Everybody knows what kind of person Peter was. He, was, uh, he had a great heart, but he was also extremely impulsive. Um, when you look in John, you don't see many personality traits about him, except, of course, in his own gospel. And you can tell not by his own uh, narrative about himself, but by the way he speaks. And that also comes out in 1 John. And even though we might think of Revelation as a vengeful and wrathful book of the Bible, you even see it in there. This, of course, is a huge departure from what we, little we do see of his personality in the gospels. Him and his brother James, of course, very famously um, attempted to have Jesus call down fire upon a village that refused to accept him, perhaps thinking back to the contest between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. But um, Jesus then nicknames them sons of thunder to deal with those tempers. And so when you see John, by the time he writes this gospel and by the time he writes the other books that he's associated with, Nothing of the sort. You, you just see love pouring out. You're also going to see that at this little essay that he starts off with in the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was a witness to bear, I'm sorry, he came to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear our witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and of truth. Immediately, just in the first few words of John, we see a difference between it and the Synoptic Gospels, which is the perspective of the beginning of Jesus. In Matthew and Luke, they start with the well-known Christmas story, right? We have angels coming to tell all sorts of pe people about the uh, coming king, wise men, shepherds. You know the story, right? And uh, with the exception of Mark, who gets pretty quickly into the narrative of Jesus' ministry, and he just says, this had been prophesied by Isaiah, and then he goes ahead and he starts talking about it, which is still an earthly perspective. John, on the other hand, emphasizes the heavenly perspective. You know, if you were to go to a Christmas pageant, you would... Like I said, you'd probably hear a lot of passages re uh, read from Matthew and Luke, which are fantastic. However, I think when thinking about the birth of Christ, John's perspective is one that is often overlooked, and it really shouldn't be. And the reason why is because John emphasizes the condescension of Christ. Now, when we hear the word condescension, we typically don't think that's a good thing. The reason we don't think that's a good thing is because it's sort of been used sarcastically so long from its original meaning um, that, that the sarcastic meaning has become the real meaning. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. What, do you think you'd be particularly complimented if I called you Einstein? Probably not, right? I've been called Einstein a lot of times, and I don't think people thought I was very smart when I was called Einstein. Uh, one that I always I have a little bit of resentment that it's come to have a sarcastic meaning is uh, oh how the mighty have fallen. Once again, it goes to this idea: ah, you thought you were so great, and now you're, you know, you've been humbled in some way, which is a shame because uh, when King David wrote that in Second uh, uh, Samuel chapter one, 
it, it wasn't sarcastic. He was mourning somebody, an arrogant person being Saul, but it was legitimate mourning for him, and it was it, it's beautiful prose and in mourning for Saul. And it's a it's almost a shame that when people say that, you immediately think sarcastic about it. Well, the truth uh, with uh, Einstein being used sarcastically and oh, how the mighty have fallen sarcastically, uh, when it comes to condescension, there's a little bit of sarcasm with that as well. I'm here to tell you that uh, uh, condescension is not necessarily a bad thing. What is condescension? In its most literal meaning, condescension means coming down. And so if we typically use it, we mean somebody was acting as though they are that they are above me and that they had to walk down to my level. And so it's a uh, it, it's an accusation of pride, condescension. But there's also a thing, such a thing as true condescension. Somebody being in a higher position, but then lowering themselves to the lower one for the benefit of the person who is lower. Now, once again, there's a way that this can be done, which is not a good thing, which is an arrogant thing. Typically speaking, if you look at yourself as somebody who is in a higher position, uh, that's already a bad start. But... Sometimes you can have somebody who is in a legitimately higher position. I'll give you an example. Uh, a parent and a child. It is undeniable that a parent, by nature itself, and of course, Bible as well, look in Ephesians 4, children obey your parents, that the parent is above the child. And every single person in here, at some point, had their parents say to them, because I said so. That phrase only works because you are the parent. Have you ever tried to say to some say that to somebody who is your equal in every way, your peer? It doesn't work out very well, does it? I might try saying that to my wife, and uh, I'll send you all the picture of the black eye, and you can find out how that works out. <laughs> but that's a fact about condescension, by the way, is that... Uh, if somebody truly is in a higher position, as, if, as much as we might not like the because I say so answer, honestly, that is a legitimate one. Might not always be the best one, but sometimes it's a legitimate one because God himself has placed somebody above the other. But sometimes condescension can have a powerful effect. With my own father, I got a, a, an answer once that was very similar to uh, because I said so. I think I was about 13 years old, and uh, I can't even remember what it was I did, but I got a tongue lashing over it. And while I was, Dad was telling me about this, I, I, I mentioned, Dad, you do the exact same thing. And he said, do as I say, not as I do. Well, the truth is, uh, that person was above me, and uh, I wasn't in the position to tell him how to correct himself. He was in the position to tell me how to correct myself. And that could have been it. But honestly, this was one of the incidents in my childhood that made me respect my father the most. Later, he condescended to me, not as somebody who is arrogant and say, look how much better I am at this than you. No, he legitimately condescended to me. He said, son, I was wrong to say that to you. I shouldn't be doing it either. We're both going to stop. That's a legitimate condescension. That's not a condescension out of arrogance. That is a condescension out of love. Okay, what does this have to do with the birth of Jesus and the general Christmas story? Well, you know, today's November 3rd, right? So it's time to start celebrating Christmas anyway. No. The reason I point that out is John, John's account, even though Matthew and Luke tend to be associated with that story of the birth of Jesus, I feel like John tells us so much more about a sacrifice that has already been done. When you look at the hardships of Matthew and Luke, and there are some hardships in there for Christ, are there not? I mean, he might not have been uh, aware they were happening, born in a manger, uh, having to flee to Egypt because of the wrath of King Herod. None of that compares to the loving sacrifice that started from the very beginning. Had that not been the case, had Christ been born the son of Caesar, the most powerful man on earth at the time, and had he been born to 
all sorts of acclamation and trumpets and treasures, it still would have been a condescension. It still would have been a great sacrifice. That phrase, and the word became flesh. It's not telling us all the details of his birth, but it's telling us something extremely important. Jesus, who is God, became like us. God walked among us. All right, I got a little bit of ahead of myself. I wanted to mention that, though. When we go back to the beginning of our passage, John chapter 1, verse 1, a couple of things need to be noted. First, the term word there. There's a good chance that your Bible capitalizes the word word. There's a reason for that. It's not because of any specific meaning in the exact translation. The word there is the Greek word logos, which means word. But one, simply from the context, you can tell he's not talking about words in the same way that I'm speaking words right now. It's something that is special. Um, it is said that perhaps John might have been thinking about a Jewish tradition um, of talking about God when he is doing things like a human being, a mundane action of referring to the word of God doing this. For example, in Genesis chapter 3, when we see God walking in the cool of the evening like we would expect a human being to, the Jews, in their reverence for God and perhaps overzealousness to, uh, to avoid taking the name of God in vain, they would go to some pretty extreme uh, measures to do that. For example, something that's pretty important in the book of John, it was a pretty common thing in the Jewish culture of the day to refuse to use the phrase, I am, for anything. Even if you were talking about mundane things, you wouldn't say, uh, I'm going to, I am going to the grocery store. You'd have to find some different way to phrase it. Uh, my destination is the grocery store or something like that. And they were doing that because uh, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and he asked, who should I say sent me? He says, I am, tell them I am who sent you. That I am name of God was important to the Jews. And another thing they would do is if God is doing something that is like a man, like walking around in the cool of the evening, they would also say things like the word of God is doing this. It's been supposed, and I'm not enough of a scholar to tell you with any sort of certainty. Uh, I'm I'm just relaying a, a supposition I've seen. But it's been supposed that John was taking this idea that we are having the word of God, but it's not just the words he speaks. It is something that is of his uh, essence, shall we say, and um, still completely God and yet separate at the same time. Gives you a little bit of an idea of the Trinity anyway, doesn't it? He takes this word and he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. And there we have to pause again to mention an error that is taught. Um, our friends who would use the New World translation, uh, if they would read that, it would say, uh, and, the world, and the word was a God. Now, typically, I try not to quibble too much over versions or um, over exact phrasing. However, when you translate something in such a way, and it's very clearly because you're, you, you're setting it to affirm your pre-existing theology. In other words, I'm not changing what I believe to fit the Bible. I'm literally changing the Bible to fit what I believe. Uh, I have a lot less graciousness towards that, unfortunately. And so when we see somebody doing that, well, Unfortunately, the translators of that translation believed that Jesus was not truly God, and so they choose to translate that the word was a God. There's a couple of problems with that. I won't bore you too much with the Greek, um, but one of those problems is there's no such thing as an indefinite article in Greek. Uh, an indefinite article is when you're describing some sort of thing as a uh, indicating that there's a multiplicity of them. Uh, for example, if I said, 
I was, I am going to a hotel later today. You know that there are several other hotels out there in the world. However, if I said I am going to the bathroom, you know I'm only talking about one. Now, yes, there are several other bathrooms, but I'm talking about one specific. Uh, a better idea just to solidify this might be that the Earth rotates around, or I'm sorry, uh, orbits the sun. There's only one sun. Now, there's several stars, but there's only one sun. Well, a definite article like the exists in Greek. An indefinite article, which indicates that there might be many, it doesn't exist in Koine Greek, which the Bible or the New Testament is written in. And uh, every time you see an indefinite article, somebody had to insert that in, that in the translation into English, and usually it's only in places that make sense, right? But there's a reason nobody else translates it here, a God, because it does not make sense in the context nor with the grammar. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, that would still cause a contradiction within the Bible, even if the proper translation was a God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the, uh, the Lord is one. Both things cannot be true. It's at the same time, there cannot be multiple gods and still one God. There can only be one God. So John is talking about this one God. All right. Now, he goes into all this, and by the way, the whole point of this little essay at the beginning, which uh, verses 1 through 18, uh, that's a little good description. It's, it's a quick essay of who Christ is, not coming from the earthly perspective, but from the heavenly perspective. The whole point of it is to prove that Jesus is not merely a human being, that he is God. And that happened several times without the, throughout the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. By the way, this intentionally picks up some ideas from Genesis. It's using the same exact phrasing. It wants the audience to think back to Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him not anything was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Pause there for a moment. The John that this uh, is speaking of here is not the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John. This is talking about John the Baptist. This is something that all four Gospels have in common. Is Very quickly, they go into John the Baptist and his importance. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave uh, the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. What we have here is John is talking about who John the Baptist was. Part of the reason all the Gospels start off talking about who John the Baptist was is to indicate that Jesus, who came later, was better than John. There was a time that John the Baptist was more famous than Jesus. And by the way, put, put yourself in the Jewish shoes of those days, and you have John the Baptist coming along. Now, in the Old Testament, sometimes we have the, we have the mistaken idea that you have prophets and miracle workers you know, running around everywhere because it seems everything we have in there is, um, you know, this person did this miracle, this person did this miracle. Yeah, that's, and they were certainly around, but they weren't a common thing. I think if you do the math, it, it comes out, you basically get one prophet per generation. And then when you look at a lot of what we call the minor prophets, you know, some of these prophets are just coming around and um, pronouncing doom on some nation that isn't even you. So there's a lot of, um, the, it was never a common thing to have prophets around, but still, you're a Jew living in the first century. For 400 years, God has not spoken to your people through the prophets like he did before. 
400 years. And the very last thing that he said was talking about he was going to be sending somebody big. And by the way, when you look through the Old Testament, you tend to see a, a little bit of a snowball in the subject of a Savior coming. The first time we get a little bit of hint of it is in Genesis 3.15 when, you, you know, this is after the, um, uh, the punishments that God gives to Adam and Eve and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And after you have these punishments given to Adam, you're going to have to toil. And Eve, you're going to have to be submissive to your husband and you're going to have to have pain in childbirth. First he says to the serpent, on your belly you shall go. And then he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. And you shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. A lot of people have interpreted this to talk about how so many women are afraid of snakes. And that's what this is talking about. Well, I, I don't think so. For one, I've seen some men who get pretty afraid of snakes. <laughs> and truthfully, if I don't know it's venomous, I'm pretty afraid of snakes too. <laughs> um, that's probably not what he's talking about here, though. There's a couple of indicators he's talking about something greater. One of those indicators is the phrasing, which is very strange. I'm going to put enmity between you and the seed of the woman. See, typically, that sort of phrasing within the Old Testament, it's more focused on the seed of man. But you have a seed of woman over there. And when he speaks about it, very clear he's talking about something big, not just some guy accidentally stepping on a snake in the middle of the field and it, it gets one last bite in on him and so he's going to be sick for a while, maybe even die, but the snake sure is not going to make it. That's not what he's talking about. That's the imagery he's using. But he's talking about Christ from the very beginning. As soon as there was a problem of sin, a solution was given. Wasn't going to be at that exact moment, but... If Adam and Eve were saved, then it was saved by the same solution that we are saved with today. And so you go throughout the Old Testament, and it's at first, it's just these little blips every once in a while, very small things. And if you're not paying super, super, super close attention, you're going to miss it, just like Genesis chapter 12 and God's promise to Abraham. And you keep going, but as you go through the Old Testament, it sort of snowballs, and you have more and more about this coming one. Now, if you're a Jew, you might notice, hey, there's definitely an escalation here. Who is going to be coming? Is he about to come? And then if you're paying real close attention to the scriptures, you realize God's going to tell me exactly when he's coming, or pretty close to exactly anyway. He's going to tell me where he's coming, what he's going to do. All of that's coming up. People are looking for it. And the very last thing that God said in the Old Testament for 400 years of silence, if you go over to Malachi chapter 4, he says in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. I am sending you Elijah. And he's going to come, and he is going to turn the hearts of everybody back towards one another. Turns out he was talking about John the Baptist. He wasn't talking about a literal coming of Elijah, which many thought, and that's almost reasonable considering the fact that Elijah never died. He went up in a whirlwind, so perhaps you might think, well, now he's going to come down in a whirlwind. He, he went up and he came back down. But that's not what he's talking about. He's coming. To, we're talking about somebody who came in the spirit of Elijah. This was a really big deal in the Jewish world when after all of this escalation, you have silence for 400 years. And then in comes John. And you can see what a big deal John was throughout the whole time. You want One of Jesus' best defenses that he has against his enemies who wish to harm him, but when they try to do so by tarnishing his reputation, he often appeals to John and how John said, I am lesser than he. 
And so they kind of have to shuffle around because they don't want to say anything against John. Apollos, for a while, was preaching about the baptism of John without even understanding who Christ was. And so there's an emphasis on John. Not that John wasn't great, but that he was preaching somebody even greater. This is for the benefit of the audience who understand John, but don't understand Jesus. And when you see this language about it, there can be no doubt. John the Baptist, honorific, wonderful man. Jesus rightfully said up until that point that he had been the greatest. But there was one who was coming who was better than John. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he, has got, he was before me. From, full his, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. That phrase, grace upon grace, F.F. F. Bruce uh, mentions that and compares that almost to ocean waves. The idea is, I am receiving the grace of God, and it's not a one-time thing, and I don't, you know, I, I've received the grace of God, and now I have to be absolutely perfect, otherwise eternal damnation will be my fate. No, it is grace upon grace. Very similar concept to, to Jesus' teachings on forgiveness, uh, 70 times 7. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This first phrase is almost a, or this first little essay that John has before he gets into the book. And by the way, he, when you read through it, it's this really interesting transition because I mentioned John is such a pers personal gospel. Um, but for the rest of this chapter, he's going to talk about John the Baptist. And then the first thing we see Jesus doing as a human in John's account is being baptized himself. And then the narrative very smoothly transitions into Christ the man and what he was doing. But John keeps everything in perspective. The very first thing he says is, I'm going to tell you about who Jesus was as a human being as he walked this earth. But you need to keep something in mind. This wasn't any mere man. This was God himself, condescended to man, though he did not need to condescend. And by the way, there are times where he chooses not to condescend, especially in the Old Testament. Isaiah 45, shall the potter say to the clay, from whence have you made me? Or Job 40, uh, shall a fault finder contend with the Lord. Those are times when he chooses not to condescend and he has every right not to condescend. But because God is a God of love, though he does not owe us condescension, though he owes us nothing at all because of love, he comes to us God as man, word becoming flesh. And it is a wonderful blessing we have, and I encourage you, to look closely at uh, John's words here. I thank you very much for your attention. I kind of wrestled with this text. Thanks, Uncle Doug. Uh, but I learned some interesting things while doing so, and hopefully we'll have some things this evening that are helpful as we think about not only looking at the Word, but being transformed by it. So. What do you think of when you think of John chapter 2, the first 12 verses? Chances are it's some of these things. The suspense. There we go. There we, there we go. As to the suspense, this is what I heard growing up. Right, The conversation isn't about really what happens in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It's about, well, did Jesus make non-alcoholic wine or alcoholic? And what are the specifics of that? And how did it work back then? 
Not saying that that's a trivial or unimportant discussion, but is it really at the heart of this account? What about, I believe, uh, our second to last verse, this beginning of signs. Well, was this the first sign that Jesus did at all? Was this the first one just in Cana? What about his childhood growing up and the things we don't know about? I've heard this when we consider these 12 verses. Why would Jesus go to a wedding? Why would he do something as ordinary as this mundane event? Surely, within the scope of his ministry, there were other important things to be doing. So I've heard that before. I've also heard this one, which we'll talk about briefly because we have to talk about it a little bit. Why was Jesus rude to his mother? Well, we'll examine that. But I've definitely heard that when we consider this account. And again, when we read these verses, what should our takeaway be? What should we gather? In other words, what's the point? Are all these things good conversations to have? Sure. Are they valuable for our knowledge of a well-rounded view of Scripture? Sure. Is it the heart of why John, as DJ has introduced us to this guy, Is it at the heart of why he has introduced and included this little section into the life of Jesus in his narrative? On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. There were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. He said to his servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who drawn the water knew, The master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. You have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. His disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. I want to suggest to you this evening that in this big block of text, there's certain things that stand out when we want to get an understanding of what John's getting at here. We're going to talk about Jesus being invited. We're going to talk about his statement to Mary as something we need to discuss. I also want us to see just how focused Jesus was in this brief story. I believe what we see from his character and from his actions here is ought to be our takeaway. And then the second to last thing I've highlighted, manifested his glory. I believe those are the three most important words in this paragraph. So there's your snapshot. Jesus was invited to a wedding. We also often don't think about Jesus as a real person. We believe, okay, he's a man, he's God on this earth, but he did normal human things. We don't get hardly anything about the first 30 years of his life. We get a lot about his birth, the accounts that DJ referred to. We get a lot of information about his birth being foretold, it happening, the circumstances surrounding his birth. And then we get one little section when he was 12 years old. And for the rest of the 30 years, we get nothing. We have no idea. We do know that he was growing. We can see that in the birth narratives. We can see that in the temple narrative. We can see that he was growing consistently in every way. You know, as a person, in the esteem of others, in the esteem of God, he was growing socially, he was growing mentally. So he was growing, but what was all taking place? We don't know. We don't know if he had many friends or a few friends. We don't know the full extent of his family. We know many of the names. We don't know the full extent. We don't know what he got into in these 30 years. 
But then we get to John chapter 2, and John includes this story of all things he might have kicked off the gospel with. He might have just started with cleansing the temple in verse 13, but he didn't. He started in verse 1 with a wedding happening on this particular day, the third day that he's been talking about as this narrative is kicking off. So let's not miss the fact that as Jesus was here to do amazing things, he also lived here as a member of the community, as a man. I think if we fail to grasp even a little bit what it meant for him to be here as a person, we miss what makes him relatable to us as a high priest. So don't miss the fact that 30 years is a long time. I'm not 30 yet. And so to think all of this is leading up to everything we get about Jesus. And sometimes we don't even think of it, about it happening. He just sprang into being at age 30. That's not what happened. So he's living here in this community. He's clearly known by people. He's there with his family. So he was invited. He wanted to be there. Again, John is including this. And inspired writers, I believe, typically have a wise idea of what's going on in their narrative and what is going on in the text. And if Jesus didn't want to come to this wedding, he didn't have to. He's an adult. But his family is invited and he tags along. And that's why we get the scene that we get. So Jesus was living as a member of this community. Why was Jesus so rude to Mary? We read his words. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me, says the New King James. I don't want to talk to my mother that way. Right? That's what we think. Uh, English translations do a really good job. And I'm thankful for the people who have translated the Bible over the years because it is a hard job and an important job, but it has been done well. Some things in Greek just don't translate well or we may have not done the best job of making it sound right in the tone we would expect. So yeah, I'm proud of this one. He wasn't. I would suggest to you that Jesus, far from being rude, we don't know what tone he said this in exactly. I would guess, kind of a quizzical one, as he genuinely asked Mary, what does this have to do with me? And the second part, I think, is more important. My hour has not yet come. That's what we're going to clue in on. I also want to point this out. If we would take this in a vacuum and consider nothing else about the ministry of Jesus, we may say, it does kind of sound rude, especially in this English translation. It sounds a little wooden or, or brusque. But this isn't in a vacuum. We have the whole Gospels to tell us what Jesus thought about women and how highly he valued them. Jesus, in every instance, we're going to talk about some more this weekend, valued women, put an emphasis on them above that which society gave to them. And so I felt the need to mention this, but I do not think he was being rude. This is something that is interesting. From the text, it doesn't appear that Jesus wanted to perform this miracle. It seems like he knew he could do something, but didn't necessarily want to. He says, my hour has not yet come. I'll give you four pieces of evidence to support him not wanting to start performing these miracles yet. Notice what he says to Mary. Notice what he does with the servants. He doesn't go up. When he finally agrees to do this, which we'll talk about because it's kind of strange, the, the one verse to the next. When he finally agrees to do this, he doesn't go to the master of the feast and say, you've got a problem, I'm here to solve it. He doesn't even go with Mary to the master of the feast or do anything like that. He talks to the servants, the ones who aren't going to get the attention, the ones who aren't going to be noticed. Jesus was very discreet in how he went about this. We see it's the servants who do everything. They get the barrels. They 
do what Jesus told them to do with them. They fill them to the brim. They take out some water. They realize this has been turned into wine. Something amazing has happened. They're the ones who take it to the master of the feast. They're the ones who are standing there when he says, why did you put out this, this good stuff in the back and not start with it? They're the ones who have to take that. And even afterward, when the master of the feast finds out, he doesn't find his way back to Jesus and say, thank you for doing this. Or, I'm so glad you helped us out of this pickle. And why would you save the best for last? We don't get any of that. Jesus was not implicated in a positive way here. He didn't take the glory. No one knew that he did this besides, it seems like, this small circle of people. His mother, his friends, his, his close disciples there, and the servants he told to go about performing the miracle that he would give to them. So it doesn't seem like Jesus wanted to start performing miracles. Why is that? It's a thought-provoking question. What is the point of a miracle? This is something I've heard a lot about growing up. You know, what is a miracle for? Why, why do we have them? Why did Jesus do them? Why did the apostles do them? Why did people in the Old Testament do them? The thing it boils down to, most of all, is that we wanted to inspire something. And when we think about Jesus, he comes on the scene. What does he have to prove? That he is someone otherworldly, in a sense. He's in the body of a man, but he is the son of God. He is a spiritual being. He has powers beyond what we can do. And so the point of Christ's miracles were to show to these people, I'm something different. I can do things y'all cannot do. There's my Tennessee influence coming out. You know, I'm trying to do better with that, but it, it slips in sometimes. So it's, it's, it's to inspire faith, right? He wants people to believe that he has the power to do something. He liked changing lives. He took joy, it seems, in making people's situations better. But the main thing he was doing was leading them to believe that he was who he said he was. I would suggest that the second point is also seems to be the case. He did not want to start his widespread fame. Now, we don't know exactly how much time passes between verse 12 and verse 13. It doesn't seem like too much time. And you might say, well, isn't his fame going to start when he goes into the temple and makes a scene? I think that would be a pretty good indicator. Something is different with this guy, and he, he's there to prove a point and start a movement. But here at this wedding, it's like he doesn't want to do that. And we're going to see the end. It's like he had the, a different kind of purpose than we may assume he would have in this situation. So I would say he did not want to start his widespread fame. So why then did he do it? It's interesting. Mary comes to him and says, look, they're out of wine. And he says, what is this? This doesn't concern me. My time hasn't come yet. And we don't know how much Mary comprehended about who Jesus was and what he was about to start doing. But maybe she was a little confused by his words. Maybe she wasn't really registering with them. But then the very next thing, Mary, without question, says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Is it just me, or does it seem like there's a disconnect between Jesus saying, my hour hasn't come, and then Mary saying, something's going to happen? There's a disconnect there, seemingly. A tangent about weddings. I don't think it would be atypical for people at this wedding. I don't think when they ran out of wine, it was like a, we're out of wine. Oh, well. I think it was probably like a, we're out of wine. Like, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this situation? People typically aren't relaxed during weddings. Uh, I feel like it should be the opposite, but... 
I've lived long enough to know that it is not really the case. But with this disconnect, I don't know if, I'll tell you what I believe it is not and what I believe it is. I don't think this is Jesus being challenged by Mary. Like, she came to me with this problem, and I didn't want to do it. It's not my time. But to kind of show her that I, I can and to prove myself, I'm going to do it and just wow everyone. I don't think that was Jesus' intention. We get the, the fuller picture typically. We go to Matthew when he had the encounter with Satan in the wilderness. What did all those things have to do with? They had to do with pride. Look, you're hungry, right? You can make these stones become bread, right? You're the son of God. You can just jump off of this. You made the world. You can jump off of the temple, right? And you'll be fine. You can have everything. All you have to do is subject yourself to me, right? He just fought a big battle with pride not long before this, the start of his ministry. So I think it, it would be odd for him to have won that battle, been ministered to by angels, and then here to be faced with a minor crisis in the eyes of others. Hey, we're out of drink. I'll show them. That's not the Jesus that we read about in the New Testament. So I don't think he was being prideful. I do think he had genuine care. DJ mentioned Jesus coming in the spirit, or John leading the way for Jesus in the spirit of Elijah. And the ministries of people in the Old Testament and the New Testament mirror very well. I think that Jesus took interest in the lives of people. Flip to the Old Testament and I want to point out just a couple things that show us what Elijah and Elisha were doing. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. Bring me a new bowl, said Elisha, and put salt in it. So he went to the source of the water, cast the salt in there, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remained healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha. But that's not it. In chapter 4, we get the well-known story of Elisha and the widow. And she has no husband. She's there with her son. They think, our lives are over. And Elisha actually has this oil fill every container she can find. He raises someone's son from the dead. Then there's a bunch of like minor, strange-seeming miracles that Elisha does with the power of God. Chapter 4, verse 38, there's a pot of stew, and the men try to make it. You know, Men cooking doesn't always go well. And here, Elisha makes it better. Verse 42, a miracle that will be echoed in the life of Jesus with multiplying food. Elisha, through the power of God, does that. For the man, he heals a man from leprosy. And the one that sticks out to me, has always stuck out to me, is chapter 6, verse 1. This guy borrowed an axe, and the head fell in the water, and it sank. It's heavy. This is so insignificant, really, in the grand picture of what's happening in Israel and Judah and the life of Elisha. What does he do? He goes, he tells him, Listen, there it is. He throws in a stick. Iron floats. That's a miracle. Iron does not float. So he helps that man out of a spot of not being able to return a borrowed tool to his neighbor. Why do we bring this up? I think since so many of the miracles of Jesus echo the ones in the Old Testament, especially in Elijah and Elisha's lives, and being consistent with the character of Jesus, I think we see in the Gospels, he took interest 
in making people's lives better. We see this in many miracles, and I don't think this is the primary reason for any miracle or the only reason for any miracle, but I think it can be a reason that miracles, you know, when he would heal someone and they'd be able to walk after never walking in their life, yes, he was pointing to his ability to do that that came from God. Yes, he was pointing to his role as the Messiah who is coming into the world to change things. You think that man went back to his house with a changed life because of the good thing that Jesus had done for him? Definitely. And there's that dual nature in a lot of the miracles we see. Help spiritually, help physically. So I think that Jesus could have genuine care about people he was in contact with. Again, a community that he was living in for 30 years. People that he knew well, perhaps. People that he knew of. His mother who was concerned. He cared about the situation enough to do something. And while this might not have been the time for him to really burst on the scene, because in the next verse after this, he'll go to Jerusalem where the heart of everything happens and he'll make a scene in the temple by cleansing it. I think this may be a time where, again, back to those three words that I said, I think were the most important in this section, he would manifest his glory. I think this was his time to do something that would strengthen the faith of the people who were right there. So those are three ideas. So what's our takeaway? If we come to this story, maybe our takeaway are the, the four things that we talked about at the start. Well, what kind of wine did he make? Why was he here? What other miracles had he done? Was this really the first? Yes, Jesus could do miracles. I don't want us to miss that. I think if we miss the fact that Jesus could do miracles, we miss some of the wonder. Think of when you're a small child and you are maybe reading these stories for the first time. We've read some of these stories hundreds of times at this point. Think back to an early time. Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was saved from the lions? How did that happen? That is not something normal. That is something amazing. Jesus did a lot of amazing things. And if we just view him through the lens of him being a spiritual teacher, we catch an important side of him, perhaps the most important side of him. But if we miss the fact that he did good for people and that he did amazing things that no one else was able to do, we miss out on a big part of his life. Many of Jesus' miracles were these sort of minor things. We'll see tomorrow in John 6, he makes a boat immediately appear on the other side of a sea that has been stormy and windy. That's all throughout his ministry. So... Don't miss the importance of Jesus being able to do miraculous things. And how did he do that? He did that just like Elijah and Elisha through the power of God, but with one key difference. He wasn't a prophet sent from God. He was God, as we just discussed. How cool is it that for thousands of years, since the time of the prophets to now, miracles had been performed by men, and now they were being performed not through a man as a conduit of the power, but by the man who had the power. So Jesus could do miracles. And here's what I think my takeaway has been after this study. He wanted to create faith in the people who are closest to him. You can almost imagine if this is a big crowded setting, a wedding, in Jewish culture where everyone is close and everyone is living in community, there's that small circle. Mary finds him. He's there with his disciples, the servants who are right there ready to hear his message. And what happens? His disciples believed in him. And after this, they leave. 
just like nothing had happened, but something did happen. Each of those people had a seed of faith in their hearts because they saw, saw something incredible from Jesus. That's something I don't always appreciate. But every time someone has an encounter with Jesus, they leave different than they started. And here, these people probably didn't wake up that day thinking, we're going to go to a wedding, they're going to run out of the wine, and this Jesus who I've known my whole life is going to just make a barrel full of water into wine. They probably didn't expect that when they woke up, but it happened. And when Jesus manifested his glory, that sparked something in everyone who was there witnessing. One of the tidbits from the Gospels that always stuck out to me was Mary's recognition, especially after the temple scene. Mary kept all these things in her heart, is the language there. And we can't underestimate how important it was for these people living in this time to see something amazing, to see a miracle of Jesus and be transformed because of it. I want to close by again looking at who Jesus talked to. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. She had some level of faith already. Now there were set six water pots of stone. And skipping down, he said to them, fill the water pots with water. They filled them up to the brim. He said, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And if you've got the Bibles that have Christ's word, words in red, that's it. Because he doesn't speak again the rest of the account. But look who was impacted. The master of the feast realized that something had happened. The servants certainly knew as the water they had just filled up turned into wine, something had happened. The disciples realized something had happened. His mother, his brothers, though his brothers apparently did not accept it. With these simple words, Jesus transformed lives. And we're going to see that all throughout the book of John in a variety of contexts, people who had not grown up with Jesus are going to be transformed by him. People who don't like Jesus are going to be transformed by him. But here we cannot underestimate the importance of a little seed being planted that allows someone to be better because of it, that allows them to know Jesus, want to learn more about him, want to follow him, I wonder how many people who were here at this wedding who believed in him stuck it through to the end. We don't know that. We could speculate. But that's something I wonder. How many believed all the way through? We don't know. But they certainly began to believe here. And it was because Jesus did amazing things. So this beginning of signs... I believe it is the beginning of signs that Jesus did. If we read the text carefully, the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, this region he had grown up in, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Tomorrow we're going to spend a lot of time as we think of the journeys of the people who believed at once as they went on through their journey of faith. But for now, at least, this is an account where we can get a glimpse of what it was like to experience Jesus.